Okay, so, hi everybody. First hi. off, I'm going to take a picture for the guys back home, so I want everyone to say hello. Hi. Shout, be loud Americans, come on. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, hello everyone, my name's Graham, and today I'm going to talk about a multi-tenanted monkey solution that's powered by Puppet and Sal, if you didn't guess from the very snappy title. So, I'm the lead engineer at Pebble IT, and we're an IT consultancy that's based in London which, contrary to what some people have asked me so far this week, isn't in Australia. <laughs> okay, so we all know how awesome Monkey is. There's loads of talks this week on how to use it and how to set it up, so this isn't going to be one of them. I'm assuming that if you're wanting to scale your Monkey setup, you're already using it. So, one day, we had a client who didn't fancy paying for Casper or something similar, so we gave this monkey thing a go. So we're happily throwing our software into monkey, and that happy little monkey is diligently installing all of our machines. It was a glorious time to be alive. <laughs> I was a Mac admin god, and I'm tripping over this chair. Thank you, Alistair, for leaving that right there. There was no stopping me. Oh, monkey was a revelation. I was deploying software left, right, and center. <laughs> My Macs were updated so hard, they didn't know what had hit them. So it would be rude to keep this awesomeness to just the one client. So we started rolling out to more and more sites. To be perfectly honest, I was feeling pretty damn pleased with myself at this point. <laughs> then an office update comes out. <coughs> Not a problem, I say. I'm just going to shove it into Monkey. Monkey import, blah, 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 blah. Of course, once you have 30 <laughs> servers to import the update into, you've got quite a lot of work to do. You've got 30 lots of testing catalogs, and then once the testing's over, you've got to go through 30 package info files to promote it into production. And then you've got to run make catalogs 30 times. I hate manual labor. <laughs> if I wanted to do manual labor, I'd have a completely different profession. So our first attempt at solving this problem was running a single box in our data center and having all the clients look at that. This was clearly much easier to manage. We're back to one set of packages to look after, one set of manifests, one catalog. However, the poor chaps actually having to do the deployment are sat there twiddling their thumbs for hours on end. And it's even worse if they're at a site with a slow internet connection. It could take a whole day to deploy a single Mac. We might as well just do it by hand at this point. So this is our next attempt at solving the problem. So we were syncing from our server in the data center over to one at the client site, over a site site VPN. This worked well for small clients when we're the entire IT department and we're able to get a site site VPN set up. But then a few things changed for us. Rather than being the entire IT department for smaller clients, we're starting to consult to larger enterprises. The depth of the X server on its own wasn't a massive problem for us. When we're just talking about a monkey server, a Mac Mini is probably fine anyway. And for the size of clients we were dealing with at the time, <coughs> Mac Minis were pretty normal. However, a one new server is easier to get into the corporate data center than a Mac Mini. Lion server. <laughs> oh my word. What a complete and utter piece of you-know-what. We had enough problems trying to convince Big IT that Macs are real servers, as we can't integrate them into their VMware environment, or we can't even give them a one-new box to stick in the rack. And then we get this steaming pile of badness. It's the final straw. We were bidding OS 10 for our monkey boxes. So once the decision had been made to move from OS 10, we decide to extract ourselves from the business of managing the hardware completely. Plus, management does love a bit of buzzword bingo, so moving things into the cloud is a very easy sell. We evaluated a few solutions, but we ended up settling on AWS. Gave us the best balance of performance, reliability, and price. So, back to replicating the monkey repos to our clients. Obviously, we're not running OS 10 in Amazon, we're running Ubuntu. And to be honest, the site site VPN requirement was a bit of a pain. We couldn't always get one set up. And we quite clearly did not want our clients to have to run OS 10 servers. So we had all these web servers to configure. I wonder what we could use to automate this. We're already using Puppet to configure our client machines. So it made sense to use it to bring up these servers as well. So why would you need Puppet? I mean, you've got bash scripts that could set this all up very easily, right? I mean, you could just do it by hand. I mean, I'm a consultant. My t any time I spend is billable. 
humans make mistakes. <laughs> Computers only screw up when someone somewhere has stuffed up. By automating everything we can, we don't have to worry about typing in the right commands every time. So for those of you who don't know how Puppet works, here is the 10 second overview. You specify your desired state, Puppet will run, it's going to compare the desired state with the actual state, and it will make a correction if one's required. At the end of the run, you get a report of what it has or hasn't had to do. So using Puppet requires a change in how you think about your servers and the clients. Gone are the days of writing long bash scripts that will configure your servers, which only work when the sun and the moon are aligned and it's a Tuesday. Puppet forces you to think about how you want your servers to look in their finished state. So before we move on to the specifics of what we did, I'd like to make sure everyone's on the same page. So let's have a look at some Puppet code. Um, before I go on, who is currently using Puppet or has used Puppet before? OK, some of you. Okay. So we're describing how we want this file to look at the end of the Puppet run. We're not telling the system how to create the file, how to set permissions, or how to set ownership. Puppet extracts you from the mechanics of what you're doing, and it's going to translate the stuff you mash into your keyboard into something that the operating system, whatever operating system you're deploying on, will understand. So the first thing we want to configure was a local software update server. Reposado came out just as we were configuring, considering moving away from our end server. It allows us to use any old box to serve up Apple updates. Fortunately, it's really easy to set up. It's just a web, web server, a few files to throw out, and a plist to configure it. So this is the beginning of our Puppet class to set up a local Reposado server. At the top, we're defining some variables that can be different for each server. We've set the directory that Apache is going to serve for software updates and the directory we're going to install Reposado to. Those two have default values set up because we're very rarely going to need to change them. The only option we have to specify is the URL that Apache is going to serve for software updates because that's always going to be unique. Well, should be anyway. So once our directories are present, we're using a pre-built Puppet module to clone a specific version of Reposado from GitHub. By specifying a specific version, we're able to make sure that no other well-meaning engineers who might be working on the server are going to go in there and update Reposado past a point where we are happy with it working. If the Git revision changes, Puppet's going to put it back to where it should be on the next run. So as I said before, Puppet will abstract you from worrying about how, to, how each OS does things. But it's not always possible to abstract yourself completely. So at this point, we're checking what operating system we're running on. And we're only applying this to Ubuntu boxes. As I said, we're only deploying Ubuntu at the moment, but we're not assuming that's always going to be the case. We might move on to CentOS or Red Hat or wherever. So other operating systems might not need curl or Git to be installed. They might come with it already installed. Or they might have different package names. And you can only manage each item once in Puppet. So we're only in making sure it's installed if it's not been previously defined in another class or manifest, because it's quite, they're quite common packages, to be honest. So now on to setting up our actual Apache vHost. We're putting the machine's entry in the host file. The dollar colon, colon, colon IP address comes from Factor, and we'll cover Factor in a bit more detail later on. We're using the Puppet Labs Apache module to configure our vHost. And you see the line that says require. That's because Puppet doesn't necessarily run everything in the order. It doesn't necessarily run from top to bottom. So we have to specifically chain the bits that have dependencies together. The host, host file entry and the cron job at the bottom doesn't really matter when they're set up. They'll work however. However, Apache will throw a hissy fit if you try and set it up when it hasn't got the file it needs to serve out. And the final part of the class is going to be setting up Reposado's preferences file. And because each one's going to be different, we're going to use a template as a content. And here's that template. This is for the normal preferences plist that I'm sure most of you are using. We've got placeholders in there for the host name, and the directory repo sync is going to put the updates. So client machines aren't always going to be in the office, and we have everything we need in the cloud. So why can't we use our server when they're out of the office, rather than us having to go through the hassle of getting external DNS entries configured, holes punched in server firewalls, servers put into DMZs, all that stuff. So we use this Apache configuration. That was inspired by Sean's work. Thank you very much. Um, all ni an requests initially come to our servers in Amazon. And if the request comes from a known client WAN IP, they can be redirected to the local server for the actual download. 
And to make our lives a bit simpler, we configure all the clients for the same software update URL, regardless of which operating system they're running. We then redirect them to the right catalog for their operating system at the server end. So the only difference between the client's configuration will be whether they're on production or testing branches. So all of that work up front means this is all we need to do to stand up a local Reposado server. So that's Reposado, now on to Monkey. These are all of the options that we can pass to our class. Uh, we set sensible, sensible defaults for most of them. And once again, the only one we need to set up is the URL we're configuring. So to start setting things up, we make sure that our directory exists. And if we're running on Ubuntu, make sure that WWData owns the directory and to recurse those permissions to any file that is under it. And now for the actual sync script, which we'll take a look at in a little while, and the excludes file. The excludes file is a list of directories that our script shouldn't even bother to try and sync. That, that, as we'll see later on, the clients can only get to their own files anyway, but this just stops the rsync from failing. We make sure there's an appropriate entry in the host file. And now for the actual vhost. If we want the repository to be password protected, bear in mind this is going to be behind their firewall, so they might not care. It's up to the client. We can pass username and password to the class, and it's going to password protect the local repo. If the username's blank, the repo will be set up unprotected. So this is how we'd actually configure a local monkey server. This particular client has two different sites. But by using the IP address of the server, we're able to change the value of the URL that it's going to be serving updates on. So we can use the same class for both servers. And you might have noticed that I've completely glossed over how I set up SSH keys for all the servers. That's because I still do it by hand because I haven't thought of a good way of automating it. So if anyone's got any ideas, <laughs> oh, I'm not that stupid then. <laughs> OK, so having to make a pirate class, a puppet class for each server, when the majority of the settings are going to be the same, seems like a load more work than it really should be. Hira is an application that allows you to have a hierarchy of YAML files on your puppet master that will contain values to override default values in a puppet class. Blank face is good. <laughs> um, <laughs> This is the YAML file that specifies the order that the system's going to look for a value. Each of the variables that are in curly braces are fact from factor. And as soon as a file is matched for a client that contains a suitable value, it's going to stop going down the hierarchy. This allows you to put default values at the bottom of the hierarchy and more specific values at the top. So in this case, we have custom facts for customer name, customer site, and customer build. If there are no suitable values in those, then we're going to go down to checking on the client's WAN IP. Then finally, settings that depend on whether it's a VM or not. And then settings based on its fully qualified domain name. And then finally, defaults that we're going to apply to every node if it doesn't match anything that's in there. And this is an actual YAML file for Hira. This particular host is a monkey cache. So rather than hard coding the values into an individual class for each cache that we run, we can reuse the same class on each server and then override the, var the variables at an appropriate place in the hierarchy. So when we use that hire a config file, this is all we need to apply to get a node set, set up as a monkey cache server. So this is the layout of our monkey repo. All of the software that is outside of the client's directory is unlicensed, so we can sync it to every single server. That includes things like office updates, create suite updates, free apps, plugins, web browsers, you know, you know the kind of stuff. Anything that is client specific, such as pre-licensed software, like a Creative Cloud installer, or things like an ADE buying package are kept in the client's own directory. So this was our first sync script. It's really basic, but it did work. We started off with everyone using the same sync user to talk back to our master server, but then after 30 seconds we realized that was an incredibly dumb idea. <laughs> so then everyone got individual users. This meant that we could adjust permissions on the master monkey servers for each client's folders to only allow this, that specific client access to their, pack, their, their own packages. So obviously, we've got users only being able to read their own data via SSH. <laughs> but they still get to other, able to get to other people's packages via HTTP. As whilst they have individual HTTP passwords on each client, we had a single Apache directive for managing those passwords, which meant everyone could go everywhere with their password. Whoops. <laughs> So to access the client's folder, you need to have a username and password in that specific file. We then have an HD password file that contains all of the usernames and passwords, so they're able to access the shared packages at the bottom. But there was a slight problem with the sync script. I mean, yeah, sure, it worked. 
but our sync was taking out age to compare the files. Some of our clients have 50 gig Final Cut Studio packages. And it's not unusual for them to have three or four different Create Suite packages. Big packages took ages for our sync to compare. The CPU usage on the server was going through the roof. We started having to limit syncs to just once a day just to keep the server up. This meant that users weren't getting software for up to a day after we put it into Monkey, which obviously made Monkey quite unhappy. So to solve this problem, we threw a bit of bash at it. The first step is to download the current date stamp file for our SCP. This last update file is updated on the Monkey box whenever anyone does a Monkey import, whether they're a human or an auto package powered robot. It's compared, and if they're the same, we're up to date and there's nothing left to do. If they're not, it's not the same syncs run. This lets us sync much more frequently without the CPU overhead if, when there aren't any updates to sync. And this is the actual script. So first off, we check if the script's already running. We might be syncing a massive package, and that's going to take hours, so there's no point running it again. We then grab the last update file using SCP from the master. If it's not the same as the one we have on disk, we need to do a sync. Once the rsync completes, we can then write out the local date stamp file. And finally, we set our permissions properly and remove our temporary files. So now we're going to configure an actual monkey client. So we used to set the package URL with Puppet, depending on the WAN IP that the machine was on. That value would normally come from Hira, but for simplicity, we're setting it directly in the class at the moment. This would be updated every time Puppet runs. But that's not necessarily the same time that monkey's going to run. So they could be trying to hit a URL that's not accessible from their current location if they're just taking their laptop out of the office. And there's obviously the possibility of the local cache server not having everything up to date. It might still be syncing if there's a big sync happening. And there is obviously the possibility of the server falling over, although clearly that's quite remote because my servers would never fall over. Um, and it might only be an hour until the next sync. But if we have a client on a deployment, they're not going to be able to install any software. And as the monkey catalogs, we're going to be telling the clients to download software that isn't even there. They can't get to it. So it's preferable to have something working slowly rather than not at all. So before every monkey run, if it exists, monkey's going to run any script that exists here. This means that if you need to make any modification to your, the environment that monkey runs in prior to a run happening, you can use this script to make sure your settings are how you want them. So this is the basic workflow of our pre-flight script. Start off with, we check if the bootstrap file is there. If it's there, we make sure the server's available. This stops the machines being unusable if someone, for some reason, has decided to unplug the machine that you left, ready, just imaging, and they managed to steal it from you before, because that happens to me quite a bit. Sorry. And OK, so it then checks what the machine's WAN IP is. The list of known WAN IPs to local servers is written out using Puppet. We then get both last update files, we compare them. If they're the same, the servers are in sync, we can use the local server. If they're different, we're going to be using the cloud. And this is our puppet class for de deploying the pre-flight script. To start off, we need Monkey to be installed. It's the Monkey installer is going to create the directory structure we need to deploy the file. And there's not really much point deploying a Monkey pre-flight script if you don't have Monkey. And we're also setting up a cu custom condition file up. The pre-flight script is going to record which server it's using. So we know which clients are always using the cloud and costing us a fortune in Amazon bills. And we're also able to spot the ones that are out of sync, so we might be able to spot any broken servers. The pre-flight script is really quite long. So I'm going to post the whole thing online somewhere. I'll probably pop it on my blog. Um, but I will, however, go over the more interesting parts. So this is the first part of our sync script. No, pre-flight script. If the bootstrap file exists, it's going to try and talk to the software repo URL, which we get from Monkey's preferences. It's going to make five attempts. If you still can't talk to it, we're going to remove the bootstrap file. And remember, this file is being written out by Puppet. So this is a bit of a Puppet template. When we configure the clients, we pass a hash of known WAN IP addresses in their corresponding local server. We then iterate over them and write out a Python dictionary. So that's going to output something like the commented out part. We then get the client's WAN IP address from a service called ICANHasIP.com. Pretty stupid name, but there we go. And then we loop over the known WAN IPs. If there's a match, we're going to use the corresponding local monkey server. If there's not a match, we're going to use the one in the cloud. So if the local URL and the master are the same, the client's going to be coming from a WAN IP address we don't know about. So there's no point carrying on. We're just going to use the cloud server. Um, at this point, we're also writing out monkey conditional, which you can use for deploying packages but based on whether they're on the LAN or not. But in our case, we primarily use it for reporting. 
we then grab the last update file from the local server. We do much the same to get the last update file from the master as well. Then it's just a matter of comparing the date stamps and doing the right thing. So we use this diagram when we're pitching Puppet and Monkey to our clients. The process of desired state and correcting any drift is really at the core of both tools. And we make a big deal about how we know everything there is to know about their Max without having to maintain any pesky manual inventory. But then we, one day we had a client who wanted to see that data themselves. They quite fancy know what their Macs are up to as well. So we cracked open the Puppet dashboard. However, our clients are largely creative types. You can imagine their reaction when they saw that. <laughs> so it's not just ugly. It's also pretty hard to find what you want. You have to keep going back and forth because you can never quite remember the name of the fact you want to search on. Then you have to add your search terms to your query by hand, and then most of the time it doesn't work anyway. <laughs> There's another major issue for us. We use a single Puppet instance for all of our clients. Even if the Puppet dashboard was the most beautiful looking app on Earth, we can't give clients access to other clients' data. So I started off thinking about forking and extending the Puppet dashboard to do what we needed. But to be perfectly honest, that wasn't a road that was ever going to end up in a happy place because I'm not particularly good at Ruby. <laughs> However, I am vaguely passable at Python. I've made Django arts before, so I had a go at it. And this is Sal. It's a single source of truth for the Macs that we manage at Pebble. There are several monkey reporting tools at the moment. Monkey report, monkey web admin, there's even monkey server or simian if you want to go the whole hog and change your back end as well. But just like Goldilocks, none of them are quite right for us. One of the primary reasons for writing our own solution is that everything else out there was in house IT, designed for only the IT department to be looking at the data. We wanted something that we could share with our clients, but also restrict them to only be able to see their own machines. Another requirement we had was to have the ability to easily extend the solution. SAL was always going to be open source, but there are obviously going to be parts that we want to keep in house. And there are also parts that aren't just going to be useful to everyone. I mean, not everyone's going to care if their machines are encrypted or not. They're not necessarily going to care if they've got machines that aren't compatible with Mavericks. But it is going to be important to other people. So they need to be able to add that. The majority of the information that Sal uses comes from Factor. Factor is a product from Puppet Labs that runs a series of scripts that generate pieces of information, or facts, about the machine. By leveraging this, Sal is able to use all of the built-in facts and the custom ones you might want to add to collect detailed information about the Macs you look after. So if you're using Puppet to manage your Macs, you get Plugin Sync for free. It's the system that Puppet uses to distribute fax to client machines. <laughs> you just drop your fax in the correct place on the file system on the Puppet Master, and it's going to be copied to the client before every Puppet run. If you remove it from the Puppet Master, it's removed from the client. It makes it trivial to manage your fax. So whilst you do have to write standard fax in Ruby, that doesn't mean you can't access the rest of the system. In this fact, we're, this is also the extent of my Ruby capabilities, by the way, so please don't be too mean on the code. So we're, in this fact, we're accessing the value of another fact to determine if we're running on 10.8 or 10.9, and if we're running on either of those, we're going to get the status out of FDE setup to determine whether file vault's turned on or not. So if you're not using Puppet, you can still extend SAL with custom facts. The SAL postflight script will load any facts that are dropped into this directory. And if you're not like me and you're not particularly Ruby inclined, you can implement external facts. These can be written in any language the machine can run. But you do have to, have to deploy them outside of Puppet uh, plugin sync, whether that's with Puppet manually or with some other mechanism, such as via a package with Monkey. So this is an external fact that will output your key for cell. As long as you return fact name equals fact data, you can do basically whatever you want with the system. And here's the same fact using Python. And you don't even need to use scripts. You can just drop in a plain text file if you want to. Because the plugins for Sal are written in Python, you can do pretty much whatever you want with them. We don't only have access to the facts from Factor, but we also have access to all the conditions from Monkey, if you prefer to extend Sal using those condition scripts. So this is the dashboard view of Sal. Here we're looking at a particular business unit, but there is also an overview, overview screen that contains all of the maps from all the business units. 
we define basically one of our clients is a business unit and their subgroupings are then machine groups. So you can drill down into machine groups as well. All the plugins here are customizable. You can show them only on a particular business unit if you want, or you can rearrange them, or you can take them out completely if you don't need them. When you drill down to one of the plugins, you get a list view. And then when you drill down to the machine, you get its detail view. All the Puppet specific parts will only show up if you're using Puppet. So if you're just on Monkey, you're not going to see them. You get a full list of what's installed and what isn't. And even if you do want to write a plugin, you can still use custom facts to get custom data out of the machine, as well as your monkey conditions. So getting SAL in installed can be as easy or as difficult as you really want to make it. Some people want or need to run their own servers. I mean, it is just a Django web app. So it's quite straightforward to get going on your own web server, whether it's on-premise or in the cloud. However, there is a much easier way. Heroku is a platform as a service that will run apps written in loads of languages, and it's got a ridiculously easy setup. Starts off, there's a free plan, and then it scales up to where you need it to go. Just paying nine bucks a month for the database would probably be sufficient for most installations. If, and if you have less than 100 machines reporting into Sal, you might even be able to get away with the free plan. OK, so we are going to have a look at getting Sal set up. OK, so start off with, I'm going to clone Sal from GitHub. Yes. How's that? And the internet is not working. Great. So I tried to do. I thought about doing it locally, and then it's kind of difficult when you're deploying to something in the cloud. So whilst we're waiting for this to come down, has anyone got any questions for me? None. Great. Go for it. OK, so the question was that um, Puppet Enterprise doesn't have support for OS 10. So how are we able to use the dashboard? Um, it is just they don't support it. Yeah, this isn't Puppet Enterprise, though. This is still Puppet open source. The Puppet dashboard has for Enterprise has a few more features. So everything you've done is just open source? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. OK, so we're done. So I'll move into the cell directory. and. The only file we need to modify is the settings file. And there's an example one in there, so I'm going to copy that. And we'll open that up. You see that? OK, so you don't technically need to edit anything in here. But we're going to change the display name, so that's the title at the top. we're going to change the time zone because the weirdo who wrote this isn't in this country. Whoa, who just plugged in an airport? Nice. OK, so I've already installed all the Heroku stuff on my computer and logged in and all that stuff. So to deploy to Heroku, you use Git. So to start off with, we need to create a Heroku instance, which is I can actually spell. There we go. Heroku create. And that's going to talk to Heroku and hopefully, if things work, there we go. Okay, so it's created our Heroku instance and it's added a Git remote for Heroku. So now I just need to add our settings file into Git. And do a commit. And now I just need to push it up. So this is going to take 
a few seconds because it's going at a trickle speed. So obviously that this isn't the only part to sell, but you still need to install some bits on the client. So whilst that is doing its thing, really slowly, that's bad. So Heroku is now going to detect that its Python app is going to install all the dependencies for us, and just we just leave it at this point. So over to my installer and just run the package. This is going to do the post light script for Sal and all of its dependencies. So it's going to stick some stuff in user local Sal as well. Okay, so that's installed. And when this is done, we've just got a couple more commands to do to set up the database. But still trying to run this now space. So now's a good point for questions. Again. Yes. Yes. I talking about Docker containers and how that's an easier way to, or well, just as easy as to deploy it. Yes, I've seen those, but I haven't had a go on Docker yet, so um, I can't really talk about it. <laughs> Kind of difficult to talk about something you have absolutely no idea rather than something I have a vague idea about. Okay, so it has installed the dependencies, compressed the app, and now it's going to launch it. However, if I went to that address now, it's not going to work because I haven't set up the database yet. So there's two commands run Python manage sync db. So this is can connect to a terminal session in Heroku, and we're going to see it setting up a few database tables. Hopefully, there we go. And it's going to ask us to set up an admin user. I'll say yes. Um, username, I'll do, how much? Do I need an email address? Password, password. And it even tells us what we need to run next time. So manage.py migrate. There we go, right. So now all's left to do is to do a monkey run to get my inventory up into SAL once this is finally finished. Seriously? Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay, so we're all done. So I can type in Heroku open, and it's going to open up Sal for us. In our default browser. Let's log in. So this actually isn't going to have what going to have worked because I didn't set up a business unit or any machine groups. So machines are contained within machine groups. That's how you can categorize each particular client's type of machines. And then, as far as we're concerned, a business unit is a separate client for us, or however you want to set it up. So we just need to create a business unit. And this is where we'd give particular users access to the business unit as well. So we'd set up a username for each client, say, and they'd be able to log in. And we need a machine group. Okay, so that's all set up, and we've got all the information we need to configure our client. So you can use MCX or profiles to configure the clients if you want to, but I'm not. I'm just going to use defaults. So sudo defaults write library prefs. So that was our server URL. And each client machine identifies itself with a key. So each group has a key, and that's how you can categorize your machines. So now what well, remains? For a monkey again. 
it's going to chuck its report up to the server and the server will actually know what to do with it this time. There we go. Okay, so our machine's popped in. We can see that I'm running 10.94, less than a day of, less than a day of uptime, more than eight gigs of RAM. And if I was one of our users, I'd probably be asking them to clear some stuff off their computer. And shockingly, we have MacBook Pro there. OK, so if we drill down into this one, normally this would have a lot more machines in. It's just my lonely little computer in there. You see loads of info about the machine, um, own software update, public version it's running, and see what stuff it's installed. See it's Factor Facts. These are all just the default ones that come out of the box if you install Factor off the Puppet Labs website. There's nothing extra been added in here. And all of monkey conditions as well. So this is Sal as it comes out of the box. But as I said, it has loads of plugins that you can, well, say loads. I've written a few plugins, and there's a couple of other knocking around as well. So this particular mythical client would like to know if their laptop's encrypted or not. So we're going to add that in. So to start off with, I'm going to clone my plugins repository. Into the plugins folder. And is this going to work? Maybe. There we go. OK, so if I go into there, I can see that there are a few plugins installed. But we only really care about the encryption one. So to start off with, there's a git ignore file in that folder, because that's the only way you can get an empty folder into git. So we need to get rid of that to start off with. And we're going to commit the encryption plugin. Okay, so now we just need to push it up. And much the same as before, it's going to chuck our code up to Heroku and restart our instance, although it's not going to take quite as long because it doesn't need to install any dependencies. So this plugin does require some custom facts, so <coughs> you need to get those onto the machine as well. Um, normally you'd put them out either via Puppet or via Monkey, but I'm just going to install it now. Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, nothing, clearly. Um, <laughs> they are, yes. Hey, you're the name file, right? um, yeah, I just did a whole folder. Oh, it's there you go, that's what's in there. So we've got some stuff on get, putting out the admin users and battery charge and things like that. OK, so that's done. Now I just need to submit my inventory again because we've got new facts in there. So obviously the sal doesn't know anything about it. And oh, no, too quick. There we go. Right, so I can see now I've got encrypted laptop, no encrypted desktops, and nothing is unencrypted. So as I said, the plugins are written in Python, so they do have access to the entire application. So we can put some settings in here, because this particular client doesn't really care if their desktops are encrypted or not. They only care about their laptops. So if we head back to our settings file, and I can never spell this, Encryption show desktops. Make that false, and it's not going to show any desktops. <coughs> there we go. Pop that up. 
Okay, so we don't need to do another monkey run because we're still using the same facts. We're just check, changing how we're displaying the data. So that's going to restart the application. So whilst we're here, is there any other bits that anyone would like to see of Sal? I mean, I've shown you a lot of it. Don't be shy. No? Okay. <laughs> if I had prepared for that, yes, I would. But um, they're on GitHub, so you can have a look. Um, yeah. I haven't quite prepared for that one. Okay, so now we're just seeing that we've got la encrypted laptops and the slow internet has just shown us a nice square and server picture of a laptop for some reason. Okay, anyway, is there anything else before I move on? Do anyone want to see on this? Go for it. We're only, we're, sorry, the question was, uh, am I worried about um, licensing for distributing software to everyone? Um, as I said, stuff that we can't distribute, the client's own stuff, only goes in their, direct, only in their folder. That is only synced to each client, that, the owner of that software. So you might have 10 different copies of Adobe. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yes, we do. Um, but you have, you're completely up to date. I, I'm, 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 I'm not like all my other users and I actually install my <laughs> updates, yes. No, it will show you um, outstanding third-party software in Monkey and Apple updates as well, if there are any. And I tried to leave some, but because they're all unintended installs, so they snuck in. Um, actually, I can do one, so I can delete some software. Okay. Show you that. Um, what am I installing? Don't need that anymore. I'm going to go away. Okay, so check for updates. There we go. Hopefully that's small, huh? Sorry? Hopefully that's small, huh? And also the monkey repo is on a VM in my machine. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't quite trust the internet for that. Okay, so it wants to install Atom, and we should see that pop up. There we go. So we've got pending third-party updates, and that will work for Apple updates as well. Anything else before we move on? Okay, cool. Um, okay, now. Has anyone got any questions? Because we have loads of time left, and I expect there to be way more questions than this. Come on, please be nice. Let's go for it. Yes. Uh, sorry, the question was, are we using everything open source? Yes, we are. Um, no commercial software in us at all. Um, there are some bits which are closed source that we've written for Sal, which we can't release, but Everything's open source. Um, what was that last uh, thing you everything we use is open source, and but there are some closed source bits which we've kept in house. But um, so, not to no, not at all. They're, they're, they're bits which most people wouldn't care about. Only only we care about them. Um, Papine. Okay, so the question was, um, obviously, because all our packages are up in the cloud, um, what does it cost? Basically, was that the question? Am I getting yeah, the wrong gist of that? How does it compare versus just you know, having it all on site for them? Um, well, obviously, this is a managed service. So it is going to cost them a little bit more. However, but it's less time for us to go and admin things. So swings and roundabouts, really. And they are still pulling the majority of the data from their local server anyway, because most people will be in the office majority of the time. 
So it's only really when they're out and about they're actually pulling stuff from us instance in Amazon. Well, okay, so the question was, do we have a... <laughs> we do actually pay in dollars because it's Amazon. Um, <laughs> but, um, no, the question was, do we have a cost? And it varies wildly. Um, we have some clients who just deploy Chrome and Citrix Receiver, and that's it. And we have others who deploy Final Cut, uh, Creative Cloud, you know, schools, they get their software basically for free. They have, you know, 200 gig loadout, basically. So it, it varies wildly. Okay, so the question was, do we have a spe standard spec for local servers for the local cache? And generally, we'll use whatever they've got. Um, if we are supporting them or just supporting their Macs and they've got an existing PC infrastructure and someone else is looking after that, then they'll have an infrastructure for us to use. Um, if not, um, Dell or HP. It, it, it's, it's only a web server. It's really low traffic. I mean, we've even tried putting it on a Raspberry Pi, and it works. Ish. <laughs> um, it wasn't great, but yeah. For allowing the business units to access Sal um, for the users to log in and do their own stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, my equivalent to that would be like the departments that we serve. Is there any kind of Active Directory or Web App integration? Um, not out of the box, but it is Django. Uh, so, there are modules you can add in. And because this started off as Monkey Web Admin, and it shares a fair bit of its code. Um, someone has done that for Monkey Web Admin, and I believe someone has translated that over. But because it's not something I've needed, it's not something I've done. Anyone else? I think we're shy. We've got like 27 minutes. Yes, um, basically, no, it doesn't do that out of the box. Um, so yeah, the question was, uh, can you click on a custom fact or a piece of software and see who has that installed? Um, no, the answer to that, you would need a, you would need a plugin. Um, but you could probably crib one from the pending third party updates, one because that essentially does the same thing, just it limits it a bit more to see who is left to install that piece of software. Anyone else? It's something I've been working on, but it's it's really difficult to translate what you can do in a plist to a GUI and still maintain all the flexibility. Because if you have um, conditional items and things like that, how do you put that into a GUI? And to be honest, things like Monkey Admin are pretty good already. It's going to be really tough to beat something like that. And there's run this in parallel with any other Monkey products. Yes. Uh, <laughs> We have uh, Monkey Web Admin. Um, we have Mandrel set up to edit the manifest online. Um, that works really well. Um, what else do we use? We did have Monkey Report PHP for a bit, but um, we got rid of that. <laughs> um, yeah, loads. Um, there's no. If you use something like a preflight D, you can say you'd run multiple pre or post flight scripts. You can. There's no reason that you can run this alongside something else as well if you really wanted to. Anything else before we wrap up then? Okay, well, go for it. What's your favorite beer? My favorite beer? <laughs> Funny you should ask that. <laughs> um, right, so we've only got 25 minutes left. So, um, <laughs> however, there, there is a ta there's a brewery called Beaver Town who are literally five minutes away from my house in London. You should check them out. They're, in my opinion, the best beer in the world. There we go. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up. Um, Thanks a lot, everybody. Um, shout out me on Twitter if you think I'm an idiot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> rest of my contact escrow, details. Man. What? <laughs> Blocked. Um, <laughs> yeah, 
get in touch with me at grahamgilbert.com and leave feedback if you really want to. Um, thanks a lot, everybody.